two, one. Hello, everybody. My name is Mike Lagerquist. We're here at Vine Faith in Action in Mankato, and we've got a very important uh, presenter today. Well, she's, of course, very important in any role that she's in, but today she is here as president of the Minnesota Lyme Association. Have I got that correct, Dorian? You are correct. All right, and I'm going to call her Dorian Schaller only because that's what I know her as <laughs> from uh, from way back when we first met, but Schalmers. Uh, is is the president, and she is going to talk about, it's, it's that time of year, folks. You know, I've seen people say the first mosquitoes have been spotted and swatted in most cases, uh, but she's going to talk about Lyme disease and how we can be ready for it. So I will uh, let you take over from here, Dorian. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, so first of all, thank you so much to Mike and to Vine Faith in Action for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I have a very special place in my heart for Mankato. I was a student at Mankato State University back when it was still Mankato State University. I was a member of the theater department there and did several productions there. And I also was an Ellis Street singer, um, which was directed by Dr. Alan Wartman, who some of you may know. I know Al does a lot of things um, through Vine. You also may know me, um, I look a little different um, in this format, but I've been one of the original cast members of all the Church Basement Ladies musicals since 2005. So I also do group sales for um, the, all those productions. So I've worked with Mike to help set up those trips that Vine takes to see the Church Basement Ladies. Um, in those shows, I play Karen Engelson. I'm the brunette in the show. So <clears throat> I look a little different. When I'm on stage, but um, it's been a great, great adventure. We've been doing it since 2005, and we were supposed to open a new show last September, which would have been the ninth Church Basement Ladies production. Um, of course, because of COVID, we were unable to do that, but hopefully sometime in the future, we'll see that Church Basement Ladies 9 come forward. My other, connect, my other trips to Mankato have been with another group called the Looney Lutherans. So we've done a lot of shows in Mankato and one of them was the first fundraiser for the capital campaign for Vine Faith in Action when they were going to do a fundraising campaign to do the remodel on the government building they had bought. So it was the Looney Lutherans and Pi at Hosanna Church for a thousand people. So it was, so much fun and so great. So we have a, the Loonies love Mankato. So we're actually going to be at a women's conference at Hosanna on the morning of the 24th of April. <clears throat> so we'll be in Mankato. So it's very exciting. But um, today I'm here as a representative from the Minnesota Lyme Association. So I'm going to share my screen with you now so that you guys can see all this wonderful information. So need to go back up here to the beginning. There we go. So the Minnesota Lyme Association um, works to provide support services to patients with Lyme and to prevent new patients from getting infected. So today's presentation was written by our medical director, Dr. Betty Maloney. And, and okay, have you shared yet? Because we haven't seen anything yet. Oh, you don't see anything? No. Oh, okay, let's go back here. <laughs> I'm glad you said something. I would have just kept talking. There we go. All right, now you can see it. Perfect. Yep. Let's go back up. All right, so here we are. The Lyme disease, um, Dr. Betty Maloney was the one who created this. So this was put together by a physician. Um, I am not a physician, but I could play one on TV. <laughs> <laughs> so, here we go. So today's talk is about protecting you. So we'll cover four main topics. So why MLA wants you to know about Lyme disease. Number two, how Lyme disease may affect you. Number three, how you can become infected. And four, what you can to do to prevent that from happening. So why should we all learn about Lyme? Um, so for starters, it is the most common vector-borne disease in the United States, and case numbers have been increasing. Most people who get Lyme will be successfully treated, but for some, Lyme can become a debilitating and chronic illness. So the risk of getting Lyme disease is much higher than most people recognize. In some ways, it's just 
like the tip of the iceberg. The CDC used to emphasize surveillance case numbers, but surveillance cases are a very special type of case. Think of them as the tip of the iceberg. So with the rest of it hidden from view. So how much is underwater? Well, 90%. So that's because in 2013, the CDC released a new estimate of annual cases to 3,000. Now this um, presentation was last updated in, 2000, in 2020. And as of 2021, just a few months ago, the CDC has raised those numbers to 476,000 new cases per year. So Lyme can cause serious problems. So not only is it costly, it can be very disabling and reduce someone's ability to go to work or to school. Uh, a national survey of people who reported having chronic Lyme found that two thirds reduced school and work hours and one quarter received disability payments. Uh, only a few doctors in our state know how to treat complicated uh, cases of Lyme disease. Most have been led to believe that Lyme is relatively uncommon and doesn't cause chronic problems. So they don't see a need for advanced training. So this has created a doctor shortage and many, many Minnesotans have to leave Minnesota to get care. Now, looking at this map of the reported cases that meet the special surveillance criteria definition, you can see that most cases are concentrated in Northeast and in the upper Midwest, which of course we are a part of. But you can also see that there's pockets um, up by Seattle, in San Francisco, and then along the Gulf Coast. Um, case, cases are reported based on where someone lives and that might, may not be where they picked up the infection. So for example, a case in, from Montana, they might've picked it up on a, a trip to Connecticut. Even in the high risk states, the risk is not equal. So as you can see with this map of Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, these, this sort of forms this band where the highest number of cases run through those two states. Um, so let's talk about, oh, did I have a, hear a question? Nope. Okay, let's talk about the risk in Minnesota. Now, the state is always in the top 10 states for highest number of reported cases. Uh, in 2018, we ranked sixth with 1,541 reported cases. Now, going back to our iceberg analogy and accounting for Minnesota doctors doing better at reporting than doctors in other states, it's likely there were 7,500 to 15,000 cases in our state and not just the 1,541 or so that our health department reported to the CDC. So now deer ticks transmit Lyme and they are found throughout the state. You know, most people think of rural areas and forests, but there are plenty of ticks in the Metro because um, ticks can be found at campgrounds and parks in the rough of a golf course and possibly in your own backyard. Now the risk from the Minnesota department, this risk map that you see up here from the Minnesota Department of Health, that shows the risk of getting Lyme or another tick-borne disease called anaplasmosis. The darker the color, um, the higher the risk. So only those Minnesotans who live in the Southwest of the state and never travel outside that region are seemingly safe from Lyme disease. So who is at risk? Well, people travel. So most Minnesotans are at risk, but some people more than others. Um, anything that puts you in a tick habitat puts you at risks. And a few things are listed here. Um, even if you stay clear of those areas, if your pets are allowed to roam outside, they may be bring a tick home to you. So owning cats that go outside actually carries more risk than owning a dog, which is sort of surprising. So risk is also related to age. Um, right now, school-age kids have the highest risk, followed by middle-aged adults. But you can see we have people in every single age group that this touches. Now, before we get too far, let me give you a brief overview of Lyme disease. So Lyme is a bacterial infection 
Um, humans and animals can become infected if they are bitten by an infected black-legged tick, which is also known as the deer tick here in Minnesota. Now Lyme has three distinct stages. It has early, late, and post-treatment. And not everyone goes through each stage. So symptoms, and symptoms can vary from person to person. So here's the bacterial cause. This is called Borrelia burgdorferi, which is actually a family of bacteria. Um, in the US, we have one major species, but in Europe, they have three. So that causes even more problems for those. Um, individual species differ in other ways in that they can affect test results and treatment. Um, plus each species may have several variations known as strains. Now this bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi, is very sneaky and it can adapt to life in a wide variety of host animals without being killed by their immune systems. So Lyme, the illness here. So getting back to the illness, it's important to recognize that no two patients look the same and an individual's symptoms often change from day to day or week to week. In early disease, the bacteria is in the skin, but later it spreads throughout the body. It especially likes to attack nerves, joints, and the brain. Both of these stages need to be treated with antibiotics. And despite treatment, some people never really get well. These folks have post-treatment Lyme disease, which is sometimes called chronic Lyme. Now, early Lyme usually begins one to two weeks after a tick bite, but it can show up anywhere between two and 30 days after a bite. Um, it has four main forms. So some people um, don't have any symptoms. They're asymptomatic. Others have uh, erythema migraines rash. A third group may feel like they have the summertime flu where they'll have fevers and chills and body aches. Um, the fourth group is what we call the luckiest group because they have both the rash and the flu. And the reason that we consider them lucky is that it's a little bit easier to diagnose if you see that rash and have those flu-like symptoms at the same time. Um, although many doctors still order blood tests um, for Lyme disease, it's important for you to know that the results can cause confusion. So Lyme tests look for antibodies to the bacteria, um, but it takes time for your body to actually make antibodies. So studies have shown that most people test negative when they develop their rash. But so these false negatives may mislead your doctor into thinking Lyme has been ruled out, but that just simply isn't true. So treatment for early Lyme disease requires at least three weeks of, anti of oral antibiotics, such as amoxicillin, ceftin, or doxycycline. Um, Dr. Maloney has analyzed the studies and found that too many people remain ill if they get just 10 to 14 days of antibiotics. So if you go in and, and um, they, your doctor finds that you do have Lyme disease, really push for that 21 days of antibiotics instead of just the 10 to 14 days. Um, the erythema migraines rash. Now this is the hallmark of early Lyme disease and it's called the erythema migraines rash, which is often abbreviated as an EM rash. Um, this rash has, is gonna be bigger than five centimeters or two and a half inches to qualify. So this picture shows the typical appearance of the rash, which is a solid colored oval. This color can range anywhere from a faint pink to a very deep red. Now the classic bullseye rash is the best known type of EM rash, but um, it actually isn't very common. And EMs will expand and then clear over many weeks whether or not you've been treated with antibiotics. The rash clears quickly once antibiotics have been started. But it might surprise you to know that with CDC st statistics state that 30% of all patient, Lyme disease patients never develop a rash during the early phase of their illness. So here's a few more EM rashes, the one up on top there, the right, the right one up on top. That's sort of your classic target lesion. 
but that's once again, fairly rare. Um, next to that, you can see one a rash that's pretty faint. Um, and on people with uh, who are more darkly pigmented, that rash might just look like a bruise. Also, depending on its location, that an EM may be may, might be mistaken for ringworm or eczema. It can also look like a different skin infection called cellulitis. Now, that can be a problem because the antibiotics that are most commonly used for cellulitis don't work for Lyme disease. So Dr. Maloney suggests that if you're diagnosed with cellulitis during April to October, November, ask your daughter, uh, doctor to give you Augmentin or Ceftin because these antibiotics will work for both conditions. Now, looking at late disease, um, in late disease, the infection isn't contained to just the skin. By entering blood vessels in the skin, the bacteria can travel throughout the body. Um, when it finally settles, uh, where it finally settles often determines what symptoms a person will have. Now, this is just unfortunately a short list of symptoms or problems that are commonly seen in late disease. Um, these symptoms usually start a few weeks after the bite, but some may not show up for several years. The fatigue and pain that occurs in this stage can be disabling. Uh, Dr. Maloney recalls one patient who said she couldn't get out of bed even though she could hear the baby crying in the other room. So many people have pain from Lyme arthritis, but the pain we're talking about here is due to nerve irritation from the infection. So this nerve irritation or neuropathy is very similar to the pain of diabetic neuropathy. Um, as we know from commercials, certain medicine can eliminate the pain form um, from diabetic neuropathy and this, those medications can actually help work on neuropathy for Lyme pain. So uh, now I'm gonna go through some of the most common forms of late disease. So sometimes people will de develop, develop, as you can see over on that right-hand side, there are multiple different rashes over their body. Although it might seem like they have several simultaneous tick bites, what has really happened is that the bacteria circulated in the bloodstream and then came back to the skin in multiple places. Um, another com common problem is facial nerve palsy, which is when the muscles on one side of your face uh, they just don't work anymore. So Bell's palsy is a form of facial nerve palsy, but in that situation, doctors don't know why the nerve isn't working. So and they commonly try to treat it with steroids. And that's a bad idea if you actually have Lyme and not Bell's palsy, because here again, test results can be falsely negative. So if you develop facial nerve palsy during the summer, make sure that your doctor strongly considers Lyme disease and doesn't rely on blood tests to rule it out. Uh, many experts advise treating for Lyme disease with antibiotics first, instead of going right to the steroids um, because steroids can be a problem for people if you actually have Lyme disease. Uh, months or years later, 60% of those who are infected but untreated will develop Lyme arthritis the knee is the most common uh, affected joint, but it can hit anywhere. So when small joints are involved, people can be diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. So when the infection spreads to the heart, it can cause a lot of inflammation, which can be deadly. Uh, the CDC recently published case studies about previously healthy adults who died from Lyme carditis. The electrical system is most commonly involved. It, it causes the heartbeat to beat irregularly. Brief episodes of a rapid heartbeat can occur, but the real worry is when the heart is beating too slowly. Some Lyme patients need a temporary pacemaker to keep it moving at a regular rate. When the heart muscle is involved, the heart can't pump blood well and people have symptoms of heart failure. Rarely the infection causes, causes inflammation of the outer lining of the heart. Um, if that happens, this produces pain when the person takes a, a breath, a deep breath, they can feel pain in their chest. Now, Lyme can also get to your brain. So, and infect the tissue that covers the brain and spinal cord. 
Now this is meningitis and it causes headaches and neck stiffness. So Lyme meningitis is described as smoldering because other bacterial causes of meningitis cause more dramatic symptoms from day one. Blood tests can be falsely negative and sp spinal taps might only have slight abnormalities. That's why many patients with Lyme meningitis are actually misdiagnosed with viral meningitis. Now, late neurological disease is the form of Lyme disease that can be especially hard to recognize. It usually develops months or years after a bite and we don't know how many people are affected. Um, in this stage of the, the brain and the nerves just aren't working properly. Since the nervous system controls so many aspects of our bodily functions, people who have a wide range of symptoms such as numbness, tingling, nerve pain, difficulty thinking, loss of math or language skills, um, they can also develop psychiatric conditions like depression and anxiety. Uh, Lyme also mimics, mimics several nervous system diseases, including dementia, Parkinson's disease, ALS, and MS. There aren't any definitive tests for these illnesses, so people who are diagnosed with one of these illnesses and are at risk for Lyme disease should be sure that their doctor has considered the possibility of Lyme. Now, Unfortunately, Lyme is a very tricky diagnosis because the symptoms are so variable. No two patients look exactly alike. So Lyme can mimic other diseases and blood tests are often unreliable. So it can be very difficult for doctors to diagnose. Um, I don't wanna go into the problems with testing, but it is important for you to understand that Lyme tests tend to be insensitive they miss people who actually have Lyme. There's lots of reasons for this. Uh, for example, the test can be wrong if you're tested too soon or too late. So while positive results in someone with symptoms of Lyme disease usually indicate an active infection, negative blood tests for Lyme disease cannot rule it out. Doctors who suggest otherwise are wrong and probably don't know the facts about testing. So ruling out mimics. So here are some of the many diseases that doctors have to consider when they're evaluating someone, someone who may potentially have Lyme disease. It's likely that they'll need to learn, run a lot of tests, which is a good thing because the goal is not to diagnose you with Lyme disease, but to diagnose you correctly. So antibiotic treatment. Um, Lyme is a bacterial, inf bacterial infection, so antibiotics are required. Treatment works best early on during the rash phase, but even then antibiotics don't always cure people. Those who remain ill have what they're calling post-treatment Lyme. Now, no one knows exactly why some people remain ill or what to do for them. Uh, many theories exist, but few have been proven. One thing that is known is that the bacteria has, all, has ways to trick the immune system and avoid being killed by antibiotics. It's also known that some Lyme patients will improve when they receive additional antibiotics. And there's also other things that people try. And this, this uncertainty, though, has led to disagreements and medical controversy so we really need more research in order to get everything figured out for all of these Lyme patients. So let's go back and talk about deer ticks uh, because deer ticks without them, Lyme wouldn't be an issue. So this picture up in the blue with the blue background um, shows the, distinct, the tick's distinctive appearance. So it's got a, a reddish brown body with a, a black cape on it. Um, deer ticks live for two years um, and they can survive the harshest winters. So, you know, unfortunately here in Minnesota, we, they don't freeze out over the winter. They, they hibernate, they kind of go to sleep, but then once it, the temperature comes back up to 32 degrees, they wake back up again. So um, 
the larvae hatch from eggs in the spring of year one, and then they seek a meal. So they find some, uh, some a mouse or a person or um, some other mammal to take a meal from. Once fed, they become nymphs and essentially sleep until spring of year two. That, then they take a second meal and molt into adults. Adult males and the males die. The female then may take a third um, meal before overwintering. And once she lays her eggs the next spring, she dies and then the cycle repeats itself. So every meal is a chance to become infected. And once the tick is infected, it remains infected. Sub sub subsequent feedings allow it to spread the infection to other mammals. So larvae don't hatch out of, in, uh, larva don't hatch out infected. So if you're bitten by a larva, you won't get Lyme. Only nymphs and, adult, and, and adults can give you Lyme disease. So this picture down here shows you sort of the difference down on the left, the difference between an adult and, um, and this is obviously enlarged and a larva and nymph. So in terms of tick habitat, where do they like to live? Um, ticks dry out really easily. So they require a habitat that's moist. Um, they like the shade and areas where moisture is trapped. So places like long grass, leaf litter, fallen logs, uh, and the edge of woods. Tick-friendly spots around your home would be um, bird baths and shady vegetation. Ticks also will be found in areas where mice and other hosts go, such as bird feeders and wood piles. Young ticks are close to the ground and adults can be several feet higher. So tick travels. So ticks do not fall from trees or jump. Now, if for some reason some, a tick fell on you, it would probably be because it got dropped by a bird. So they don't actually live in trees or any, I mean, it would be rare that a tick would fall on you, but I would guess the only reason is if for some reason it was in flight with a bird and it dropped on you. So for people um, avoiding, oh, I missed something here. Whoop, tick travel, sorry. Um, they, they move short distances on their own or on small mammals. Um, long distance travel is by deer or birds. Um, now black legged ticks don't go, they don't go and find a host. Instead, they wait for them to come to them. So these ticks crawl, crawl to the edge of vegetation, wait for something to pass by and then grab onto whatever brushes into them. So that's why if you do a lot of hiking, you know, stay on the trails, don't get too close to the edges where the vegetation is starting to come up because that's where those ticks are living. So when, when your pants brush by on that area, they're going to latch on and then start to take a ride. So here's um, some tick comparison. So you are able to sort of identify these ticks. Like I said, up on top here, that is, um, because they can be, you know, you can tell by their appearance which ones they are because the important one is the, the it's the deer tick that's gonna transmit Lyme disease. And these pictures sort of highlight the difference on the deer ticks on top. And then below that is the dog tick. So, or what we call the wood tick here in Minnesota a lot. So this tick has a, a white cape and then there's the Lone Star tick, which has a white dot on its back. So appearance um, can let you tell apart the ticks, but using size is unreliable, especially when the ticks have been fed, because what happens when they eat is they blow up. So based on what you learned about tick appearance, can you look at these two ticks and tell me which is which of those two ticks on the right? Yeah, so up on top there is the dog tick. So if you can kind of see way up by the head, you can sort of see that little white cape that's up on the top there, but it's really, it's hard to see because the rest of the body has become so blown up. And then um, there's the, the deer tick, um, which would which is what's the one up on top. So you can't really see its cape very well um, when it's all blown up like that, but you can kind of tell by the coloration of its body that it's the deer tick. 
So the other thing about black legged ticks is they don't just carry Borrelia burgdorferi, um, which is what Lyme disease is. It carries multiple other infections and these infections are called co-infections. Um, right now in this area, we have seven and they're listed on this table, but I am sure that as time goes on, there are going to be more, um, more infections that are found within these ticks. Um, Borrelia myomotoi was only found a few years ago through Mayo Clinic. And the problem with co-infections is that they really complicate things. Um, they complicate the picture because many of these illnesses look a lot like Lyme and it can be difficult to know which infection a person has. So people can have more than one infection at a time. You could have Lyme, you could have Borrelia and you could have Bartonella and you could have Babesia. You could have all three at one time. So people with multiple infections will have more symptoms. They'll be sicker. And some of these co-infections need antibiotics that are totally different than those that are used for Lyme disease. So people with more than one infection might find themselves on a combination of antibiotics and it might be harder for them to get better. So because Lyme is a serious illness that is increasingly common and tricky to diagnose and tricky to treat, we should make every effort to prevent it. Since we live in a high risk state, um, there are many ways to get exposed to ticks. So think of prevention as a three legged stool. And unless you pay attention to all three legs, the stool is gonna fall over. So you wanna look at pets, people and property because we don't want you to get bitten. So we're gonna make sure we protect in all of those areas. So for people, um, avoiding tick bites is the best thing you can do. So that's, that means it's important to know if you live, work, or play in an area that harbors deer ticks and to stay out of those areas whenever is possible. Now, sometimes that information isn't available. So if you're in a tick-friendly habitat, assume that they're there. And if you can't avoid being exposed to ticks, it's important to take steps that reduce the chance of a bite. Proper clothing and the use of insecticides and repellents can really help. Because those defenses can fail, you also need to do a tick check after mm -hmm. each exposure. And if you find an attached tick, you should talk to your doctor about taking antibiotics to prevent the infection from starting. So now here are the details for those three different prevention strategies. So clothing. The woman in this photo may not be stylish. I happen to think she looks very stylish, <laughs> <laughs> but she sure knows what to wear to reduce her risk of Lyme disease. So as far as clothing goes, the key is to try to cover as much skin as possible because ticks can't bite you through clothes. Now wearing light colored clothing, light colored clothing makes it a lot easier to spot any ticks that are crawling on you. So that's why she's, she's dressed in, in white. You also wanna make sure um, that you are tucking your pants into your socks. You can also buy gaiters that do the same thing that are pre-treated, but you know, if you're using what you have, this is a great, great option. If you have longer hair, um, put it in a ponytail, put on a hat, try to keep that hair out of the way. And all of your clothing should be pre-treated with permethrin. So when you come in, and also when you come in from a tick habitat, take off your clothes before walking into through your house. So um, I'm not quite sure where you're gonna do that in your garage with the door shut, I guess. <laughs> and then you're gonna go put your clothing into the dryer on high heat for an hour. Um, washing your clothes won't kill ticks, but the heat of the dryer dehydrates them and they die. So it is the easiest way, because if you think about, if you don't take off your clothes, you throw them in a pile and they've got ticks that are crawling around on them, they're going to continue to crawl around your house. So getting them somewhere safe and, and killing those ticks is a great thing to do. So as I said, you should put um, permethrin, pre-treat your clothing. So um, 
here's why. Permethrin is an insecticide and it kills ticks on contact, yet it's safe to go on your clothing and the gear. So um, I talked to Ron, Ron Shera, if you guys remember him from his outdoor shows um, out at um, Game Fair one year, and he always wears permethrin treated pants. And he goes, yeah, I found one on Raven this morning. I pulled them off and I just set the tick on my pants and it, it, it killed it right. It just went and it went over and, and died. So um, it's, it's the one thing that will actually kill the ticks. Um, it provides long lasting protection, usually two to six weeks because once it um, dries to the fabric of whatever you're doing, it bonds to the clothing. Um, and you can usually get multiple washings out of that. You can also buy promethrin treated clothing where it's been embedded by the factory and that will last for up to like 70 washings. Um, there's also a company called um, Insect Shield. And if you had gear you already liked, you can send it to them and they will, um, pre-treat that clothing factory bond it for you. So um, a lot of people now that work for places like the DNR, things like that, um, they're getting factory embedded clothing so that they're, they're safer when they're out in the fields. Um, so, and regarding the safety of using something like permethrin, the EPA has tested permethrin extensively and found it to be very safe. The military agrees and uses permethrin embedded fatigues um, in tick areas. By the way, although permethrin isn't supposed to be applied to the skin for tick bite prevention, that's exactly what's done when people have scabies. They're actually, you put permethrin on their skin for two days to get rid of the scabies and then you shower it off. So it's been used on skin. So you can feel, and so all of your gear, your camping gear, your sleeping bags, your, your boots. Um, some people I know put it, if they, you know, have a cabin, they put permethrin, I, like if they have um, fabric um, pads for their outdoor furniture, they'll spray that picnic blankets um, because you know, if you're at least, so if you're outside having a picnic sitting on the ground, those ticks aren't going to get anywhere near you because as soon as they get on that blanket, they're going to, it's going to kill them. All right. So repellents. Now repellents are different from insecticides. So they don't actually kill ticks. They work by getting the tick to move off the treated items and skin. So they're a repellent, but they don't kill them. So there's several types of repellents and this table um, that you're looking at here sort of shows you the difference between the three. So DEET's been around the longest um, and it comes in all sorts of formulations. You wanna use at least a 30% DEET um, within your formulation. So if you're picking up a bottle, you know, you can get them now at Walmart target any sporting goods store, but you want to make sure that it has at least 30% DEET in it. Now, the one thing bad about DEET is it can affect some clothing, some fabrics such as wool and synthetics. And also you're not, it doesn't do well with rubber and leather. Um, so there's been some question about its safety. So in the US, the EPA says they think it's fine for anyone over two months of age, but um, Canada does not recommend it for any children. So um, that's just some information there. Um, Picaridin uh, is newer than DEET, but it's been around for a lot of years. Um, it's safe on all fabrics and gear. There's no concern about using it on, on children. It comes in sprays and lotions and wipes. And you want a concentration of 10 to 20% Picaridin in um, any product that you might buy. And then oil of lemon, lemon eucalyptus is the only natural product that's been demonstrated in EPA testing to actually work. Um, it comes in sprays and lotions um, and you want a concentration of 7.75% and it can be, can be used on any age. Um, there are lots of other natural products out there that uh, repellents that that people use, they just haven't been EPA tested. So using deep picaritin or oil of lemon eucalyptus um, might be the best route just because it has gone through testing. Then there's the tick checks. 
Um, so once you come inside after an exposure to a tick habitat, you should look to see if any tick managed to attach itself to you. Um, tick checks need to be all over your body. Um, ideally, you would come in, shower vigorously. So come in from being out where the ticks are, take a shower, and then do the tick check. Um, studies found that if you shower within two hours of exposure, you can reduce your risk of Lyme disease. Um, and where ticks like to go, ticks like where it's warm and moist. So they like to go to the behind your knees, your armpits, you know, behind your hairline where it's warm back there, your groin. So those are some of the, the places that you really want to check well, because that they do, they are looking for those warm, moist places. Um, tick checks can be really effective, but they have to be done carefully and after each exposure to these tick habitats. And you also need to remember that your target, the thing you're looking for is very small. As you can see on that picture of that thumbnail, that's a, that's a nymph. So that little tick right there can give you Lyme disease. It's about the size of a poppy seed. That's how big they are when they're in their nymph stage. And it, it's part of what makes um, Lyme so insidious because most people don't even know they got bit because the chances that you will have seen that tick on you are just much, less than a full adult male. Um, so, so if you do find a tick, here's what you need to do in terms of tick removal. Um, if you find a tick, don't, don't, you know, no big deal. You can remove this. Just get you, so there are some tick removal um, things you can buy at hardware, at uh, sporting goods stores special tools, but as long as you have a fine tweezer, that's really what you need. You want to make sure that um, you are getting as close to the head of the tick as possible, and then you want to pull steadily upwards. You don't want to jerk it. If you can, you know, try, try to make it sort of a slow, um, gentle, you know, firmly, but gently pull it up. Um, otherwise, you might leave the head in. If the head does stick in, it's okay, your body will eventually expel it, but it just might take some time. So, so, so get that tweezer as close to, the, to your skin as possible when you're trying to pull that out. Um, wash the bite with um, soap and water. You can use an antiseptic and a bandage if you want to. Uh, and then you just, you wanna really keep an eye. You want to uh, wash, you want to um, look to make sure that you're keeping an eye out for a rash or flu-like symptoms. Uh, some people are actually allergic to the tick saliva. So they'll, they'll possibly get a rash in that area. Um, but unlike an EM rash, it will last for less than 48 hours. So that probably was an allergy to the tick saliva. Save the tick if you can. Um, if you're somewhere you can do that, that's great. You can put it in a little baggie with a um, a moist paper towel. Because first of all, if you go to the doctor, you want to be able to take that tick with you just to make sure they can identify what type of tick it is. Um, there also are tick testing sites. I, if I personally knew it was a deer tick, um, I would send it into a tick testing site. If you get that, that um, tick back and it doesn't have any sort of infections, you're golden, you're gonna be great. If it does have some infections, then you wanna, you have actually some proof that you were bitten by a tick that has infections and, uh, and you have some things to, to work on. It still doesn't mean that you actually got the disease, but you know that the tick that gave it to you. And right now they say about 50% of the deer ticks um, in Minnesota are carrying an infection. So your chances are quite high that there's something wrong with that tick. Um, woo, the longer the tick has fed, the greater the risk. Um, in some instances, it makes sense to take a few weeks of antibiotics to prevent Lyme altogether. So especially for people who you know, spend a lot of time in high risk areas, um, if, they, if they've gotten bit, it might be best that they go and get some antibiotics prophylactically. On our website, um, Dr. Maloney has a paper that she wrote 
exactly about all this uh, that was published in the Wisconsin Medical Journal. You can find it on our website and you can take it with you to your doctor. So then there's our beloved companion animals like little Pippa there. Um, so we, the companion animals generally need the same strategy that we use on humans. So try to keep your pet from entering uh, tick habitat areas. And I know that that can be very hard to do because, you know, dogs like to run and, you know, they like to keep going into the woods and all those things. Um, so and animals have different products than humans and different animal species um, need different products. So pets that go outdoors need to have tick checks just like humans. Um, you know, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people end up getting bit because you know the dog brought in the ticks, um, and especially if your if your animals sleep with you, there's you know a really high incidence that you know if they if they're sleeping with you and they have a tick on them, it's it's they, it's a good chance that they're going to crawl over to you and, and visit you. So um, ticks might might not bite a properly treated animal, but they use it as a way to get indoors. So even though your pet has been treated and they might be okay from the disease, you know, what, they're, what they have on them doesn't actually kill the ticks. It just, it keeps them from getting sick. So here's a bunch of um, prevention products for animals. Um, dogs are lucky because you can have a vaccine as a dog. A lot of people ask, why isn't there a vaccine for people? Um, there was one back in the 80s. They ended up pulling it off the market. Um, there is a French company that is a French pharmaceutical company that is in trials with a Lyme vaccine for people again. So we'll see if that ever happens. But um, so uh, several items are applied to animals coats and others to the skin. The skin products disperse out from the treatment site to protect the entire animal. Um, collars are another option. And, but also know that some products that are safe for dogs are not safe for cats. Um, and apparently it's actually, you know, the, the cats are a little more dangerous than dogs. If you have an outdoor cat, um, I, apparently it's more likely that you, they'll bring in a tick that might affect you. So, but given all the, there's so many different options and potential harm for using the wrong product with animals. So please check with your vet um, in terms of what strategies are best for your particular animal. So in terms of your property that once now, so we're going to the prevention piece of your property, it's really important that you keep your yard as risk-free as possible. Um, tick proof the areas in your yard that you use, you know, uh, clear away areas where ticks can hide or where mice or deer would feed, feel, uh, feel welcome. So also don't feed deer or provide salt licks. You know, um, deer, I've seen pictures where on one ear of a deer, they stopped counting after 350 ticks. And that was just on their ear. So they can carry so many of these little, little guys with them. Um, avoid also using plants that deer like to eat just because it will bring deer into your properties. Uh, bird feeders also attract mice, so move them to areas that you don't use that are farther away from areas where you would be sitting or hanging out. Um, the same is true for bird bass because the water that falls to the ground um, helps keep ticks from drying out. So they like to hang out in that area because it keeps them moist. Also, if you can keep your grass um, cut short, um, that helps dry out those ticks. So in terms of proper placement, um, natural sunlight will kill ticks if they don't have moisture. So put play equipment and outdoor furniture in the sun, not the shade. So there you can see um, if you have play equipment for kids, it's best if they're not under those trees, although it's nice to be in the shade, it's a kind of a, a big tick habitat for them. Um, and over here on your right, it looks like Bambi is checking out the slide there. Uh, but what, what I want you to notice is the area where the yard meets the woods. So this arrangement puts the person who mows the grass at really great risk because they're brushing into the brush where the ticks are 
um, because that's where they like to take out whenever they're mowing the lard. So if you can put a buffer between oh. your yard and the woods, um, that is a great way to keep yourselves away from those areas. Just remember to use um, non-porous materials so it doesn't hold moisture and keep those ticks in that area. So landscape insecticides, um, in some instances it makes sense to use insecticides on your property. Um, if you want to employ, apply them yourself, um, Dr. Maloney recommends the tick management handbook that was developed by experts in Connecticut. You can Google that, but it's also on the Minnesota Lyme Association, Association website under prevention. So you can get that, uh, you can get that handbook on there but there's, it's called the Tick Management Handbook by Kirby Stafford. And then the first year you spray in the spring to kill the nymphs and then in the fall to kill the adults. After that, a spring treatment should be enough. So um, it, it, if, you, if, you have, if you live in a high um, tick habitat, this might be a great option to help keep your, you and your family safe. Um, so, you don't have to do the entire property. You wanna focus on areas that would attract mice because mice are the ones who give uh, Lyme disease to the ticks a lot of times because a lot of ticks get their first meal from, from mice. And uh, so if they attract mice and are ticks, so you wanna spray the periphery of the lawn but not the sunny areas. If you've got a big open area that's all sun and you keep that short, you're, you should be good. So in summary here, um, all this talk can be summarized in a few main points. So Lyme is a very complex illness that can be tough to diagnose and to treat. For some, the infection is costly and disabling. Minnesotans are at high risk for becoming infected and CDC estimates suggest now that roughly 15,000 to 20,000 Minnesotans will become infected each year. Here are some resources um, for you to use. The one I, of course, want you to know the most is our Minnesota Lyme Association website. It's mmlyme, and Lyme is L-Y-M-E dot org. So minlyme.org. Um, we have a lot of great prevention tips on there. A lot of the stuff that I talked about today, you're gonna find on our website. Also, if you are ever in need of help, um, you think you might have a tick-borne disease or you know you do, but you can't get help, um, we're here, we're, we are an all-volunteer organization. Um, so we're just people here to help, so you can contact us through our website. We also have a couple Facebook pages, so you can contact us through that. Um, but the, the website we have is a lot of great information, so if you ever have questions, please feel free to go look at that website. Um, and Partnership for Tick-Borne Disease Education um, is the foundation started by our medical director, Dr. Maloney, who put together this presentation. So my parting words of wisdom, <laughs> if you remember only one thing from this talk, let this twist on a common proverb be the thing you remember. An ounce of permethrin is worth a pound of antibiotics. So thank you so much for your attentiveness um, and uh, allowing me to come. Is there any questions that I can answer for anybody? I will try to answer anything that you wanna know. And if I don't have the answer, I'll tell you that, but I might be able to find out the answer for you in a different format. All right, well, I've got a question, oh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, are you not hearing me? Is this better? We can now. Okay, I, I was, you know, you know, I have the two screens, Mike, and I was talking to the wrong screen. So here we are, now I've got it right. Anyway, so um, I'm not sure how, when there's so many of the symptoms that are similar, and I'm gonna use fibromyalgia as an example, with uh, Lyme disease, how the heck anybody tells the difference, especially when you know, don't know you've had a tick or if you haven't had a rash or if you did, it's long enough later that you have the other symptoms. 
how do they tell the difference? And I, the reason I'm asking is because I actually was diagnosed with fibromyalgia back in about 95 or 96. And, you know, about a year before that, uh, I had moved into a house in the woods. And, um, and, you know, and I have, and I have often wondered if I had gotten Lyme's, Lyme's disease and not fibromyalgia. And now as I listen to the symptoms, there were a couple of symptoms that typically isn't in the list for fibromyalgia, but is for Lyme's. And I was diagnosed, by the way, by uh, Rochester Mail. So, you know, I, I just, I just question all of this. Yep. So I, you know, it is, it is really tricky and it is, it is, it's complicated, but especially if you are seeing, if you had other symptoms, and once again, this is just me speaking as, um, you know, I'm not a physician, but this is, you know, right. I, I've been um, part of uh, the Lyme community for about 12 years. Um, I don't have Lyme myself. It's my daughter who's been sick since 2009. So that's where my experience comes from. And, um, and I talk to a lot of people on the phone and I do a lot of reading. So, um, so I would say if, so are you with whatever they're giving you for your fibromyalgia, are you feeling better? Are you still continuing to have a lot of health issues? No, well, actually back, back then, um, when I was diagnosed, I was in, in great pain. And I uh, happened on a um, technique that worked for me and then worked for many others and used to do workshop for people for that. Um, so, so I've done very well, but I have since um, had a, a other symptoms, a couple other symptoms that to my knowledge are not related to uh, fibromyalgia that have popped up and been quite troublesome, like the peripheral neuropathy that you talked about. Um, you know, that's an odd thing to get when you're not a diabetic. And, and there are other reasons besides Lyme's, I'm sure, but you know, that, that would be one of them. That's an example. Yeah. But no doctor has ever said you might have Lyme disease. Never. Right. Um, and you know, most of, so most of what we call them LLMDs, Lyme literate medical doctors. And these are physicians who have taken on this task of trying to help and treat people with um, Lyme disease um, within our, within a very unusual political framework. Um, it's all kind of a strange thing. So a lot of traditional physicians don't know a lot about Lyme disease. And so they're, they're, not, they're not thinking in those terms. So most of the Lyme literate doctors are functional medicine people. So they're looking at a lot of different things. So usually when you, if you were to go to see a Lyme literate doctor, there are other tests that are available that can, um, outside of what your traditional physician would give you, um, you know, they usually will give you an ELISA test and a regular Western blot, and those tests are not very conclusive. They still believe in a, most of the Lyme literate docs have other tests that they can give you, but they also believe in a clinical diagnosis. They can look at your symptoms. There's certain things that they'll, they're going to specifically look for um, to, to diagnose what's going on with you. And it might not be Lyme disease per se, it might be Bartonella or it might be Babesia or it could be another infection that you could have gotten from a tick. And they all will present in different formats. So they usually do really extensive, you fill out a, an extensive questionnaire with them about all of the different symptoms that you're having, things that have happened, you know, even from quite a while ago, because, you know, sometimes something might flare up that shows up and then you don't see it for a while. Like my daughter has Bartonella and Bartonella tends to have these, um, they're not, well, they're kind of like a rash, but they're these striations in your skin that sort of look like um, stretch marks. But when she had them, she, was 5'8 and weighed 125 pounds. And people, the doc was like, well, those are just 
you know, the regular docs like, well, those are stretch marks. Well, somebody who weighs that much and, and she was an athlete, it was like, well, you wouldn't have stretch marks. They're not, you know, but nobody, most people don't, aren't familiar with those sorts of things. So, um, and so, but those striations can be something that sort of comes and goes. So um, I, you know, if you, and, and if you ever want to talk to me about, um, you know, further about what this could look like, I'm happy to give you my phone number or my email if you want to talk about it. Thank you. I might. Thank yeah. you. Okay, sure. And I can get that from Mike if that's the most convenient. Yeah, that's perfect. If that's okay with Mike. Sure. That's what I'm here for. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering, Dorian, with the, uh, with the, mystery that kind of surrounds a diagnosis, do they ever, would they ever consider a, a treatment of Lyme disease with the, you know, to cover that possibility? I don't know if that's a, because you, you mentioned some, some antibiotics that sound fairly familiar to me. Yes. Is that, is that a, a bad thing to take in, just in case? Um, yeah, I'd like to take it prophylactically. No. no, it's actually a good thing. Um, I mean, personally, yeah. I mean, if you could get a doctor who would give that to you, um, I think it, I would do it. I mean, I know that I personally would do it only because I have seen and talked to so many sick people. Um, so I would probably, I would probably do that. Um, the, and there are some cases in some um, professions where during high tick season, even without getting bitten, um, they may be taking some antibiotics prophylactically in case they're bitten. Um, if they're in a really high risk, you know, if they're field workers and that kind of things that are out surveying or something like that. So, um, yeah, and and so sometimes it just depends on if you can find a physician who will who will give you those antibiotics. Um, and for a lot of people with Lyme disease, you know, they they end up taking antibiotics for a very long time and they can be helpful, but um, for some reason, you know, there's a lot of illnesses that take antibiotics for a long time. Like people take antibiotics for acne for years, but for some reason, um, insurance companies and other places don't wanna provide antibiotics for Lyme patients. So it's kind of, it's, it's kind of tricky sometimes, depending on your physician. Right. Maybe you covered this, but maybe I missed it, but what are the reasons that the Northeast and Upper Midwest are the most prevalent spots for, for Lyme disease? Um, that's a little, tr I mean, I think that there's a lot of a variety of reasons. So part of the reason for the, the growth of um, of Lyme disease in some ways is just the way in terms of where we're putting our houses and such, we're moving into those wooded areas. I mean, when you look at a lot of housing developments now, you know, they're along the edges, everybody's backyard is the woods. Um, I, you know, and I've heard, I've heard different um, ideas about why this may be. I had a vet who said, that in the 70s, a whole bunch of deer were brought over from Europe. Um, and Europe had, and he said, and he said, you know, the Europeans, the, these deer had Lyme disease. It wasn't, people didn't know about so much. And so with this, with these deer that they brought over for the hunters, <laughs> it sort of started the first proliferation. So it's sort of hard to know. And some of it may be that they just know more about it. So Lyme disease comes from Lyme, Connecticut. That's where the, that's why it's called Lyme disease. So back um, in the seventies, all of a sudden in one area of Lyme, Connecticut, like this neighborhood, like 51, kids were diagnosed with juvenile arthritis. Well, why well, all of a sudden would all of these kids have juvenile arthritis? So that's sort of, that's why it's named Lyme Kinetic, Lyme disease is after Lyme Connecticut. So it might be just that, you know, it's people are knowing about it more or, or the animals in that area just have it. And so it's getting passed around. Um, 
and I feel like Wisconsin's even worse than we are, especially the, the cabins in Wisconsin. I just know so many people and a lot of um, camps like Boy Scout camps oof, um, are pretty dangerous too. Um, I'm just, it's just a high rate of, of tick-borne disease that, that you can get in these areas. And I'm guessing if, if one of those kids at the camp gets diagnosed, it's probably be a good, good uh, reason for everybody else to get checked. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I, you know, part of what we try to do is make sure that people, the prevention thing is really key, especially, you know, I'm, I'm guessing people here probably have grandkids and stuff. And if they have, if they're scouts, I would make sure that they know, you know, if they go to sc uh, scouting camp, all of their stuff that they're wearing while they're at camp should be treated with permethrin, all of their gear should be treated, um, and then they should know what to look for. Um, so that, you know, and if they start to feel sick when they're at camp, you know, if they get this, what feels sort of like the flu while they're there or when they come home, you know, there's a good chance that they maybe picked up a tick while they were there. You know, and the, the high risk things, you know, golfers, golfers have to watch out because they're going into the rough. People who are gardeners, I, know, I bet there's a lot of your people from Vine who like to garden. So you wanna be be careful when you're out gardening that you, you know, you can put permethrin, you can pre-treat your, pre your gloves, um, you know, um, and if you're walking around and the, the plants are higher, make sure you got your pants tucked in and all of those things. So prevention is, is huge because if we can keep you from getting bitten, then we can maybe lower our numbers. But unfortunately, numbers just continue to rise exorbitantly. Okay. All right. Anybody else have any questions for Dorian? If not, thank you, Dorian. And, and uh, yeah, anything you want to share with me, I can share directly with those who attended today and we can we can get that that word out that way. So that sure. would be wonderful. And yeah. if anybody else has any other questions, you know, the uh, the website is a good spot. Or if you want to speak with Dorian, just contact me, and I can I can get you that her information. Happy to do that for anybody. So yeah, feel free to reach out at any point. We're just here to help. So thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. I know it's a lot of information about you know, ticks, but <laughs> I really do appreciate it. If, you know, if we can keep one person from um, getting seriously ill, then we've, we've, you know, accomplished our mission, so. Right, and, and for everybody else, a reminder again that uh, this presentation will be posted on the vinevolunteers.com homepage. And if you look for a virtual vine, that will be there with a bunch of the, the past presentations that we've done as well. So uh, thank you again, Dorian. And thank you. Thank you. I hope thank you. to be contacting you soon about some bus trips or something. I sure hope so too. It's time to get back in the basement and get my apron on, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Thank you everybody for coming. And thank you everybody. Sure check out what we've got coming up on, on Virtual Blind and the fact that come May, we may be in person again. So that'll be great. <laughs>